this is June 2nd, uh, the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives. And we have two things we're going to be talking about today. The first is the COVID response education funding, the CRF funds, looking for ways that we will be able to use those funds, schools will be able to use those funds. And second, we're going to be talking about a study related to the Vermont State Colleges and higher ed. So um, I want to welcome Secretary French, who will uh, start us off. Um, and we've got JFO in the room as well, just to give us a, a, an opening on the use of, of COVID relief funds. So welcome, Secretary French. Well, good afternoon. It's good to see you all. And it's good to see Representative Coopley's beard is growing. Uh, that's great. The, uh, this morning. <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> I haven't seen you in a while. That's great. Um, yeah, it's good to see you all. The, uh, just in terms of an overview, um, I th we found it useful. We talk about the CARES Act as it pertains to education to talk about the sort of three discrete funding sources. We have the CRF, the Coronavirus Relief Fund, which is the 1.2 billion. And then we have dedicated funds for education. Um, the uh, ESSER Fund, the Elementary Secondary Education Relief Fund, which is the $30 million, 90% of which uh, must be allocated directly to school districts. And then the governor's education, emergency education relief fund or the GEAR fund, which is $4.4 million, uh, which is uh, can be more flexibly used, I would say. And um, you know, the governor's expressed an interest in working closely with the General Assembly and determining how those funds get used. So those, so those are the three pots of money, not to conflate the issues, but they are slightly different. And there is, it's important to note there is some dedicated uh, funding set aside for education and the impact COVID response has had on uh, K-12 education. In terms of the CRF on the 1.2 billion, um, I think it's, it's hard to know at this point uh, what the impact will be, um, though we are, um, you know, focusing now on our planning for reopening school in the fall and uh, as part of building our proposal uh, to how the CR funds should be used, uh, specifically education, <clears throat> we took a look at our what's emerging as our sort of uh, planning template, if you will, and uh, decided that uh, there's at least $200 million worth of uh, applicable um, costs for the CRF to consider. And I think, you know, they, they fall into two domains. One is, um, you know, facilities, uh, upgrading school facilities, HVAC systems, and so forth. The other being the provisioning of continuity of learning. That's the technology uh, sort of related issues. Um, but those really are just placeholders. When I say $200 million, we have no way really to dig into the detail of, of what would generate that number. I think we will, um, however, be able to do that as districts engage in their planning process for the fall. And that, that planning process is still under design uh, right now. Importantly, it's with a um, good part of the Department of Health and being augmented by stakeholder groups from the education community and so forth to work on sort of definitive uh, health guidance for what the school classroom context will look like for the fall. I think once we have a better understanding of that, we'll start to see, for example, the um, sort of projected um, impact from a, a cost perspective relative to facility upgrades and modifications become more clear. Uh, but in terms of just having a placeholder, um, you know, really just by a general guess, essentially, we put $200 million into that, that area. I think I'd also draw your attention to there's really three areas that I generated that I put 210 into that proposal. 200 million be between facilities and the technology, but then 10 million, not an unimportant consideration either. And I think that's the social and emotional support domain, which really at this point um, is, is really more unclear in many ways as to what our, our costs and needs will be in that regard. But I expect that domain to grow considerably um, and, and probably be on equal footing with both the facilities and the continuity of learning uh, uh, categories eventually. Sorry, um, do you have a document for us to see at this point? Uh, not separately. I think it was submitted as part of the administration's proposal uh, for the CRF. Okay. Um, we should get that to- Oh, I'm, the... I'm sorry, I thought you had it. Yeah. I don't think that we have it in the committee yet. I don't think the committee has seen it. Um, 
I don't know if uh, Chloe or Mark, if you have access to that and could get that to us. I think it was just put out on Friday, so it's okay. understandable. It might be it might be buried in email. Uh, yes, Avery says she didn't receive it yet either. So uh, have to. We'd like to get a copy of that if you could help sure. us. Sure. Copy of yeah. that. Appreciate it. Um, are there questions at this point for the secretary? We're going to be looking at ways. We're going to also be the legislature as the legislature. The administration is coming up with with ideas on how to spend this money. The legislature also wants to take a look at this, sure. and we'll be talking about that um, in the coming testimony. Um, from people in the field. I'm very happy to hear that you are working with the Department of Health and stakeholders. Um, this is a complex process and we don't have any other examples of having to do this in the past. So we're, we're, we're designing it as we go here. Um, Chloe or um, Mark, do you have any, or do you have anything to add at this point on, on what was what was presented? Um, hi, Kate. Chloe Wexler here from JFO. Um, at this point, I don't have anything to add. Um, I will um, follow up and I can look for that document as well for you guys. Um, the only thing I will note is uh, yesterday, everyone in the house should have received a document from JFO, which outlined um, the current restrictions on, um, or at least our understanding of the current restrictions on the coronavirus relief fund. Um, so I think as the committee really starts to think about this and listens to the testimony that they hear today, um, it will be important to sort of read through some of that guidance um, just to sort of wrap your head around um, the issues that we are dealing with, with some of the restrictions on those funds and uh, to maybe help generate some creative ideas. <laughs> so Chloe, I think um, what I'd like to do is because we're time crunched, I'd like to do is maybe put you folks at the end to go through that document if, if we have time before the- Absolutely, work. that's what I think. I mean, since you have everyone from the field here today, um, it would be great to hear what they're seeing and thinking and you guys have that document and we're happy to come in at another time to discuss it. Yeah, who knows, we might have, we might have time. Yeah. <laughs> So I don't see any other questions at this point. Um, so what I'd like to do is invite, and we don't have, have um, Megan Roy in the room yet, do we? I don't think so. Um, she was gonna be reporting from the, from the field field. Um, so um, let's start with Jeff and Chelsea. Can we start with Jeff and Chelsea from the Superintendents Association? Oh, Sarita, do you have a question? You have to unmute, of course. Um, this is for uh, Secretary French. I was wondering if that some of that funding uh, will be used for helping teachers create groupings for the fall in terms of a transition. I mean, especially for students that are coming from different classes and then creating a new classroom. Um, I, I just think that that took a lot of time. That was a very complex process. And I wonder if there'll be some time set aside this summer for teachers, you know, who might be new working together with another, a new team to, to work on that. Yeah, yeah that I appreciate the question. Yeah. Go, ahead. Go ahead. I was just saying, is that in your current plans and professional development funds? Yeah, certainly. The, um, <clears throat> the, the question I think, and I was just gonna, I was thinking of, Adding, thank you for the prompt to just talk a little bit about the ESSER funds as well, because I think the uh, districts have a lot of flexibility. I think of, of the three pots of money that I outlined, I think the ESSER funds, specifically because they're targeted to the LEAs, bring with them greater flexibility perhaps than some of the, the other two sources. Um, the application for the ESSER funds has not been turned on, so to speak, for the LEA. So the funding has been approved at the state level. Uh, we have not deployed the application to school districts yet. We were um, holding that back for two reasons. One was originally the um, US Department of Education put out some last minute guidance on the equitable services provision that caused some concern. 
uh, meaning how districts would have to allocate some of this federal money and share it with uh, independent schools, private schools in their regions. Um, that, at that moment, when that first came out, we sought some additional clarity nationally and that uh, the US Department of Education has more or less confirmed that they're gonna stay with that guidance. Uh, but then the second reason it was delayed is basically at the request of the General Assembly. Uh, so I was working with the Ways and Means Committee in particular, um, they thought it would be a useful strategy to um, not have those funds go out until after July 1st so that those funds could be presented at the same time when they were confronting uh, the shortfall in the ed fund in the same fiscal year, so to speak. So I think, you know, um, to Representative Austin's question, um, there's funding on the table that can support the planning, can support uh, professional development, support all that work that needs to happen. It's a question of turning on the spigot to use that phrase, you know, when we're going to put the federal dollars out there, I'm increasingly concerned that um, we're, we need to, we need to deploy the application for the ESSER funds sooner rather than later, because we've been asking schools to do a lot of different things. And those, those funds are being held back and those funds provide, might provide the immediate um, motivation, the, the immediate means by which they can start to address some of the planning issues this summer, particularly feeding students over the summer. So I think we need to get going on the ESSER fund application. I, I do agree though, it is, it's useful to consider all the federal dollars on the table and ensure that we're using them um, as effectively as we can. But this issue of planning is a very important consideration. Um, the funding will be necessary for districts to uh, engage in the planning and to implement the planning. Um, we have a little bit of time as we're finalizing the planning template at the state level, but very quickly districts are going to need both the resources and the direction to uh, begin doing that planning. Thank you. And we also know that there's activity going on in Congress right now, and we'll be watching to see what happens there. Okay, let's move to Chelsea and, and Jeff. And what I want to do is make sure we get to all of all of these folks. Chelsea and Jeff will start with, then we'll go to Tracy and then um, Sue and Sandra, I think is what we'll, we'll do. Um, and uh, let's, if we can, unless it's a clarifying question, let's hold our questions to the end so we can have a broad conversation about everything. So if it's uh, clarifying, go ahead and raise your Chair question. Webb, you'll be pleased to know we've consolidated our testimony, VSBA and VSA. Sue Siglowski is going to deliver it. Um, right. The rest of us may have very brief comments, but we put together an outline this morning that Sue is going to provide. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Good morning, or I should say good afternoon, um, House Education Committee. It's very nice to be with you again. And we'd like to start out, if we can, with a, a, a video uh, from Ed Week. It's about four minutes long, and I believe Avery has uh, keyed it up to be able to start. Um, would you be able to play that now, Avery? Sorry, I just want to check to make sure everyone can hear the audio since I'm muted. We couldn't hear it then. Okay, I'm going to start the video over. What will it look like when schools welcome students back to their buildings? And what precautions might they take to limit the spread of COVID-19 in their communities? These questions took center stage recently when the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention released recommendations for reopening school buildings and they propose some pretty big changes to their daily operations. The CDC cautions that the recommendations should be implemented in a way that's and practical and meets the needs of a local community. It also cautions that schools that are shut down in areas with significant spread should keep their buildings closed. Here are a few key points from the recommendations. First, masks. Staff should wear masks and students, particularly older students, should be encouraged to wear them, the recommendations say. The CDC acknowledges that younger students may struggle to wear masks, particularly for longer periods of time. And it says they're most necessary where social distancing is impossible. Next, social distancing. Desks should all face the same direction, the CDC says. It recommends they sit six feet apart, which is, not possible in many crowded classrooms and older school buildings. It calls for buses to seat students every other row to avoid crowding and to limit the use of shared supplies in classrooms 
schools could be depicted and kept to individual students. It also calls on schools to consider grouping students in cohorts that remain in their classrooms and avoid interaction with students in other groups. To close large shared facilities like school cafeterias, having students eat in their classrooms instead. Third, protecting vulnerable people. Students and staff at higher risk for severe illness should be given accommodations, like the option to telework or to continue distance learning, the CDC says. Some analysis find that about one in every five teachers is over the age of 55, putting them at heightened risk for severe illness from COVID-19. The CDC says schools should have plans to isolate students who show signs of illness, and if possible, to screen for symptoms like fevers on a regular basis. It also recommends that they cooperate with local health authorities to help trace the transmission of the virus and keep it contained. So will your school follow these recommendations? State and district leaders around the country are making plans right now, and many of them are considering multi-tiered approaches that might call on schools to continue distance learning, to reopen their buildings, or perhaps adopt a hybrid approach to avoid crowding. Other countries that have reopened school buildings after closing them for the coronavirus have adopted similar precautions and face similar challenges. In the United States, one of those challenges might be state funding cuts that will make normal school operations difficult in some areas. Leaders around the country have said reopening schools is a key part of our nation's recovery. But public health officials have cautioned that until there's a vaccine or an effective treatment for COVID-19, it might not be business as usual. What reopening looks like in your school will depend on our understanding of the coronavirus and its transmission changes, the effects of the virus and its spread in your region, and the decisions your local leaders make. Thank you very much, Avery, for playing the video. And we hope you were able to hear most of it. There were a few um, times where it faded out a little bit, but we can uh, provide the link to you so you could watch it again if, if you need to. Um, right now, I'd like to just move into some of the, um, the points that we'd like to convey today, uh, including that public schools are an essential component of Vermont's successful economic recovery school officials and all the personnel are contemplating what the return to school is going to look like in the fall. And we don't know what that is going to look like yet. Each of our associations um, is participating in planning and preparations for school in the fall, but all necessary information is not in place yet. And at this point, we're not sure when we will have all of that information. Every day, we're learning about scores of items that need to be addressed and resolved in order to put school decision makers in the best possible position to support schools in the fall. And I'll give you some examples of the type of decisions that need to um, be made and the information that would need to be considered. Uh, one is social distancing. Two, personal health and safety equipment. Three, will school be distanced, site-based, staggered schedules, or some combination of all of those? Four, what will be the requirements for building operations protocols and mechanical systems? Five, how will transportation be managed? Six, will vulnerable members of the community be able to work and how will they be protected? And seven, how will we contend with an incident of COVID-19 infection or outbreak at a school? These are just examples of issues that need to be considered. There are many, many others. Some of them are much more specific than what I listed, and some of them are broader than what I listed. Reopening schools will include strategies to reduce person-to-person -person contact, as was just outlined in the video that you watched, and promote social distancing. And this may be difficult and confusing for our youngest learners. Vermont's pre-kindergarten system provides only 10 hours of education per week, which results in many children being in the presence of more than one environment in any given day. 
How can we reduce person-to-person -person contact in a system that does not provide the extended hours needed by working families? Providing early childhood special education services outside of the public school setting further increases potential exposure. Schools uh, are still awaiting guidance on the best and eligible uses of the ESSER funds, the Coronavirus Relief Fund, and the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund. VSA and the Joint Fiscal Office have been collecting information from some school districts in an effort to determine what types of expenditures may be eligible for reimbursement. Once further decisions are made regarding the eligible uses, it will be imperative that school district leaders are informed of the decisions and guided with strategies to address fiscal concerns. The Joint Fiscal Office can provide further information about their analysis of those findings. We want to let you know that we appreciate the approach that was put forth in H959, the yield bill, because it acknowledges that budgets for most districts in FY 2020 have been, 2021 have been settled and most expenses are fixed. We continue to have specific concerns about the fate of the school systems and communities that do not have budgets approved for FY 2021 and would note that the state has contributed significantly to the challenges of default budgets at the FY 2020 education spending level by adding expenses that districts cannot control in, form, in the form of the statewide bargaining for health insurance for school employees um, decision, which goes into effect during FY 2021. In summary, we'd like to let you know that the delivery of public education um, as complex as it normally is, has grown far more complex and is likely to be more expensive due to all of the concerns um, that I just outlined. At this point, if uh, any of the other um, people from VSA and VSBA, either Jeff, Chelsea, uh, or Sandra, would like to add anything, I'd like to invite them to do that um, and also um, if, if you have any questions, the, the four of us are available to answer them. Thank you. Chelsea or Sandra? Sandra? Uh, no. Sandra, I'm certainly interested to hear a little bit about pre-K. And, you know, just hearing that UVM and UVM child care and, and St. Mike's are closing. There's a lot of slots. Yes. Thank you, Chair Webb, for bringing up the topic. Um, it's, it's important and we don't have enough information right now really to think about direction, but I did reach out to a couple of colleagues and what I'm hearing from the field, um, a couple of ideas or requests are one that the issue with fingerprints be resolved. It's still lingering out there. Um, and two, that, you know, if there's any, uh, if we're thinking about strategies of how to reduce the number of environments children are experiencing in any given day, that we might think about prioritizing four-year-olds and extend the day somehow for them. That doesn't help families who might have a three-year-old and a four-year-old, but um, if we're gonna have to do something, this is what I'm hearing from colleagues in the pre-K world. Okay, thank you. Hmm, I wonder if we could extend the day to four-year-olds, could that be a COVID expense? It's kind of an interesting thought. Hmm. <laughs> um, Chelsea, did you have anything to add? Uh, no, I'm just here to answer any questions if you have any on specifically the work we've been doing with Chloe and the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, absolutely, we're gonna to wanna to hear from that. Um, why don't we move them to, to Tracy and then I'd like to move to Colin and Jeff. And then we may end up coming back to you then, Chelsea. All right, good. Can you hear me? Am I unmuted? You're good. Good, all right. Um, so for the record, I'm Tracy Sawyers, the Executive Director of the Vermont Council of Special Education Administrators. And thank you as usual for inviting me. Um, I'm gonna abbreviate my remarks with the tight schedule, but um, generally, you know, we're gonna have increased need, increased costs and decreased budgets. Um, and overall addressing regression and the impact of COVID-19 is one of the biggest concerns and it does seem to be an important way to use CRF funds. We're very concerned about 
the amount of service that is about to be requested by parents regarding COVID-19 impact on IEP goals. Um, so thinking about maybe creating a formal structure to apply CRF funds to those requests would be potentially helpful. For example, we might create a state fund that parents could use to support their own access to services, you know, through like a list of approved providers or through um, the school services um, at the district to address these requests. This is just, it's such a big issue because it's gonna and take a lot of work to figure out because it's not realistic for kids to be in classes 10 to 12 hours a day and schools are gonna be overwhelmed, um, but there's gonna be great need. There will likely be an increase in cost for outside evaluations due to the sheer volume that schools will likely see in the fall. Um, they won't have the staff to keep up with the delayed evaluations or new requests. So there's just a lot of worry about having enough people to meet that need. Um, in regard to professional development, targeted uh, PD regarding distance learning structures is gonna be necessary. And possibly that could um, result in looking into the state contracting with an entity that is trusted to offer statewide trainings for teachers that could be helpful. Um, and in general, more training on how to use Google Classroom and Zoom and how to teach in a virtual manner. Um, you can't replicate in-person teaching through Zoom, but it's clear that it's gonna need to be a tool if not the primary method of teaching for the foreseeable future. It's really important that teachers learn how to use all the features available that the technology has to offer um, for a rich, robust uh, virtual learning environment. Um, we need to address anxiety and related issues with both kids and adults when we return. We will need funding for PD as well as possible staffing to help with these needs. Teachers and other school personnel should receive training on how to talk to and support children during a pandemic and principles of psychological first aid. Um, if educators are not trauma informed, they need to be now. Um, also PD will be needed on developing healthy and safe classroom routines. And I can't stress how important this will be. Um, we're gonna have to take the first several weeks of school and it's gonna be along a developmental continuum, but to develop new routines in schools and this will be, and they're gonna be different than when we left and teachers are gonna need to talk to kids about why things are different without completely scaring them. Um, everybody's gonna need PD and help with that shift. Um, another thoughts are parenting classes or groups at night um, could be helpful. Um, teacher wellness routines are gonna need to be the norm. Um, kids will be suffering, but again, adults in the building will be too. So the social emotional needs are, are just um, huge and they're gonna have to be addressed first before kids are able to access academics. And as you heard, Secretary French is very aware of this and in support of this and a smaller group of us are working with Heather Boucher to continue to kind of look into this, this huge issue. And I would say, um, I was gonna say a bit more, but I just wanna make um, the point that we continue to be very concerned about maintenance of effort implications because um, those are very real. Schools will likely spend less because of COVID-19 and we could very well be in a situation of needing to send money back when we need it more than ever. Um, so that's just, it continues to be a big concern. And we also just wanna make sure that, you know, you all and the governor are mindful of funding cliffs from one-time financial support um, from the CRF Act, um, as we all know, at least the next two years are especially gonna be extremely challenging and likely well beyond that. So that's the main pieces of what we're thinking about and my members are, are concerned about. Thank you. And I'm sure Secretary French, at some point, we're gonna to need to have a conversation about maintenance of effort and maintenance of fiscal support. Um, yeah, interestingly on that topic, um, Tammy Colby had just authored a paper on maintenance of effort in the COVID context. And she sent it to me this morning. I can forward that on to you for review. Uh, it's interesting. And that'd be great. That's what she was doing during her, during her. Yes, <laughs> among other things. <laughs> teaching her own family. Um, thank you. I'm gonna move on to Colin and, and Jeff. Um, great, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you all, Con Robinson, Vermont NEAA. Uh, good to see folks. Um, so I just want to echo, uh, and I'm not going to repeat what others have said, but I think some of the points that Tracy just made are, are really, really critical. 
And, you know, to the point that Representative Austin made earlier, the beginning of the school year um, is very focused on social emotional learning. And so one of the most important uses we see as we enter into the new school year, recognizing that student needs are gonna be greater perhaps than ever dealing with trauma, the needs um, of staff and in, in their ability to support students in accessing their learning in that environment are gonna be greater than perhaps ever. Making sure that there's a dedicated fund to support that work and, and recognizing that districts you know, I think we all are engaged in conversations and recognize we don't know exactly what school is going to look like when they return in August and making sure that there's dedicated resources that districts can tap into to meet the social emotional needs as new issues perhaps emerge in the middle of September, in October, and November. Um, so a significant chunk we believe should be used directly to support um, those social and emotional needs of students. Additionally, one uh, idea that we want to throw out there is recognizing, you know, we all know schools are kind of hubs of our community. And I think we've seen that in this pandemic. And I think obviously that's going to continue. And students and their families are going to continue to need with massive unemployment, with all the trauma involved, continue to need access to supports and services and schools can and always already do in many ways function as that that hub for accessing those services. But think about whether or not it makes sense to provide grants to schools to perhaps have a specific staff person who is the point person for building those relationships, connecting students with those families and services. Some schools already do this, but maybe building where that doesn't exist, building that out. So there's a dedicated person who's helping to connect students and their families with the critical services and supports um, that they're going to need to be able to successfully access their learning in the pandemic environment. And two other points that haven't been mentioned. Um, one is uh, there are a lot of schools that don't have full-time nurses. If we're talking about students going back to uh, the physical environment of schools, we need to make sure that every school has a, has a full-time nurse to be able to meet the needs, the health needs of students and staff in the community and making sure that those nurses have the resources they need. I mean, we've talked about, and I think we all recognize the PPE needs for students and staff generally, but in a nursing environment, of course, if you have a student or a faculty or staff member that shows up exhibiting um, symptoms, you want to make sure you have a space where you can properly isolate them until they're able to receive the care they need and, and be removed um, from the school in a safe and, and appropriate manner. So there's obviously a waterfront of issues um, that will need to be addressed. I think the physical infrastructure ones are, are ones that obviously are really, really critical as well in the professional development. But Handling in on and making sure that there are significant resources available for schools to address the social and emotional needs of, of students and families and making sure that there are the key people inside schools to help coordinate accessing those students' uh, needs is going to be critical to allowing them to access their learning going forward. And I'll pause there. Jeff, did you want to add anything? Jeff Fannin? I don't believe Jeff was uh, able to join us. He had a conflict, okay. unfortunately. Okay, great. So have we heard from everybody on the list so far? Document. Okay, um, Chelsea, could you speak a little bit? First of all, I don't see any questions yet from folks. I, I know that we certainly have a lot um, that, are, that are out there. I, I know that um, Jim Damaray, perhaps we could start generating that list. I believe that's what the speaker is looking for from us on ways that these funds could be used. Um, is that something that you could, you could help us with? Uh, sure, of course. Sure. Great. Um, and if the, the people that have spoken so far wouldn't mind uh, sending us um, Sending us in a document um, that would be much appreciated. It's just easier than trying to scroll back through Zoom meetings <laughs> to find the points. 
Um, <clears throat> so Chelsea, um, perhaps you and the JFO could could tell us what's been going on in that conversation. Sure. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, uh, Mark Peralt and Chloe Wexler asked VSA if we could host a meeting that brought together some su superintendents from around the state to discuss some of the options on the table in terms of federal dollars um, and just to inform the thinking of JFO as they looked into the use of the funds. Um, that meeting seemed to be very informational for Chloe and Mark. Um, I don't wanna speak for them, but they then approached us to release a more detailed survey to a, a subset of our membership to get at some of the questions that they were hoping to answer. And I will let Chloe talk about those questions. Um, we received um, nine responses. It was a pretty um, lengthy and challenging survey. So we were happy with getting that many. Um, and now Chloe and I are discussing ways to present that information and um, make it a useful tool for you all moving forward. So I will let Chloe speak further to that um, and chime in if I hear anything that missing. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe, as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, well, since, you know, we have to, you know, at least be a tiny bit ahead of you guys um, so that we can, you know, come in and talk about stuff. We did have this meeting and similar to what you guys are starting to think about now, the conversation was very much um, based on trying to get a, a more detailed understanding of um, what school, what kind of expenses schools were incurring and sort of trying to think about those expenses in um, two distinct buckets. So, you know, the idea of additional costs. So yes, our districts are experiencing additional costs. Um, but when you read through some of the guidance that um, was distributed yesterday, um, also trying to think about if there are, are any existing costs that um, could potentially you know, be funded at least, obviously I, I agree with what people are saying, you know, it's dangerous to fund um, with one-time money, um, but just sort of through this period of revenue shortfall, are there um, positions at the school that, for example, they were doing something substantially different than, you know, what they were previously doing. For example, um, an administrator working in food service. Um, so the questionnaire was largely targeted at just trying to get an idea of, like I said, you know, um, how like sort of a rough idea of what kind of additional costs they were experiencing and what sort of, uh, what was the range of those costs, um, which Brad James has also collected some information on. But then, like I said, um, trying to get into some of the thinking of are there sort of initial uh, costs that are in there, let's call it their base budget, you know, that what they were already anticipating spending um, that could be covered using CRF dollars. If you think about, um, you know, someone who's doing a significantly different task or um, potentially one of the other things, this was one of the other questions that we posed for example, and I mean, this will maybe help you guys start to think about things creatively as well. But the question that we posed, um, were there any staff that potentially would have been subject to layoffs um, had it not been for the governor's directive to keep all employees um, employed? Um, so could that, could that be an area that we, could you know fund those positions using CRF money? Um, so, like I said, what we were really trying to start to think about is not only providing funds for these additional expenditures, but um, to what extent could we um, cover you know some some existing school expenses? Which, uh, if you did read through the guidance quickly, is is not easy. Um, 
so that's where we're really trying to get creative and think of some ideas because uh, the funds are, are, the CRF money is at this time extremely restrictive. Um, and as you guys know from our previous conversations, uh, there's a significant funding shortfall in the education fund. Um, and some of the discussions were around if how we could figure out how to use some of that CRF money um, to sort of reduce that funding shortfall. But we, so in order to do that, you have to find addition costs that they're already planning on spending anyways, personnel costs, potentially, um, you know, is there going to be a modification to their curriculum, um, a significant modification to their curriculum that would potentially support the idea that those funds could be covered with um, CRF funds. Um, so I really do think when you start thinking about this, the important thing to think about is um, additional costs. And, and a lot of what was spoken to today, those were all additional costs and that's great. Schools absolutely need support to cover those additional costs because when they passed their budget in March, they did not anticipate any of this. Um, and so we can't like sort of just leave them in the lurch on that. But then there's also the other bucket of uh, sort of more the state, and this is more on the state side, um, the education fund side is. Um, is there any way that we can cover existing budgetary costs? Um, I did want to, <laughs> yeah, sh I did want to flag one um, thing that the secretary mentioned earlier in regards to the ESSER funds, um, just sort of to flesh out um, sort of, and, and I maybe now that we've had this discussion about sort of the restrictedness of the funds and the idea that some of these additional costs that schools are incurring are, are very much, let's call it CRF-able. Yeah. So um, we, if, we, if we can, part of the reason of, of not sending that money out right away was because uh, it, it's in this universe of sort of scarcity of funds, we really wanna make sure that you use the most restrictive funding for, um, the things that are absolutely 100% COVID. For example, um, all of these, everything, everything that they're having right now, which um, the secretary mentioned, they're sort of like, we need this ESSER money to cover some of these costs. But mm -hmm. sort of from a funding perspective, we want them to use the CRF money for those costs and figure out how to set up protocols for that. And then the ESSER money, which is more flexible, the legislature and the administration can make a decision on how they want those funds to be distributed to be sort of uh, utilized. Um, so that's what I've got for right now. I guess I can take questions. Um, we are working. Well, thank you. It's, it, right. it's really it's really essential that the the players are working together right now. We have we have time crunches that we're gonna to have to deal with. We have money that needs to be spent by the end of December. And to that effect, uh, it, having the agency working with JFO and working with, with the field is, is critical in us, in us using this, this money uh, to, the, to the advantage of our, of our children. I'm sorry, Chloe, you were gonna say something. We've got 10 more minutes, so. Um, no, I, I uh... I was just going to say, I'm happy to take any questions. And um, like Chelsea mentioned, we are, I am sort of trying to work through how to present that, those nine super, like the data that we received in a, in a reasonable way. So I'll keep you, I'll send it to you when, soon, hopefully. I don't see any questions yet. Oh, Peter Conlon. Okay, this is probably a better question for you. And that is, as Chloe was talking about, like, the fact that schools had to keep on people who they might otherwise have laid off as a possible CRF expense. As more of those sort of pop into our heads, what mm -hmm. should we do with that information or those ideas? Um, I, I think we're, we're going to have to, Jim is going to, Jim, thank you, Jim, is going to start to put together a document. So I would say, is it okay, Jim, if we send those to you? Of course, yeah, please do. Um, and then you. I'll, I would, I would also note that um, sort of what JFO is currently 
sort of set up and you'll see that in um, the guidance that we sent out yesterday was a, a team at JFO um, and it also includes two um, lawyers from legal counsel. So they, um, Jim, when you get your sort of list together, um, it would be worthwhile to send to sort of step, the team is Stephanie, Catherine, um, uh, Steve, and then uh, Jennifer Carby and um, Rebecca Wasserman, I believe. Um, so just a thought I have, and you know, I, I sit here worried, you know, as a, as a retired special educator thinking about the regression, which is a big, big, concern. But I also think about the work that we've been trying to do in implementing, you know, uh, Act 173 and the MTSS system. Um, and I think about the work we were trying to do in literacy and the loss of loss of, of skill in literacy right now is, is a pretty big deal. Um, and I just wonder if there's a way that we could think of addressing some of our literacy goals. <laughs> Uh, some of our, our hopes that we had for literacy, that, that the plan, if we can, we can think about something in that regard um, in terms of our professional development and in, in not only increasing the remote learning around, around literacy, but also increasing just the, the, the basic um, expertise of our community in that area. Um, Wow, I think we're going to be doing this within the hour. This is excellent. Are there any, um, Peter, is that are you still, do you have another question or another thought? Uh, another thought, I just I wanted the committee to know that right now, uh, Ways and Means is still discussing our school construction bill, and uh, they're looking at some modifications that would include $800,000 of CRF money in order to study school needs to support remote learning, um, healthy environments, and social distancing. Uh, so just wanted to make folks aware of, of that discussion going on. And the Senate is actually looking at that as well. So they're looking at least at H209, our H209. So, so um, Dylan and Lynn, pay attention. <laughs> we need you there. So Rita Austin. You're still muted. You might be frozen, Sarita. She's got kind of a frozen look, doesn't she? <laughs> well, when you're frozen, when, frozen and muted, it's yeah. Zoom hell. Oh, there we go. Okay, you're you're back, Sarita. Unmute. I tell you what, when you get unmuted, you've got the floor. Oh, I got it. I got it. Okay, so this, this is kind of, again, thinking way outside the box, which I'm sure my committee just is so thrilled about. But um, I guess one of the things I'm wondering is, and I'm wondering this, you know, this, is, this uh, pandemic is an unprecedented event. And I know we're talking about the impact on children in terms of anxiety, and needing a lot of social and emotional support. Um, what I understand, and I, I studied before I became a legislator, I was really into studying the impact of trauma on children, but more like school shootings, you know, what might occur in Vermont in terms of how to help kids recover from trauma um, and flooding. I mean, I, those were the two areas in Vermont I could think about that, that children could experience, you know, trauma other than, um, in their own homes, but I'm, I am wondering about, because this is unprecedented, what data we have that children will return to school very anxious, you know, full of anxiety. I mean, they've been with their parents, they've been in their homes, you know, in most cases of this kind of trauma that, you know, like a hurricane or a tornado or whatever, earthquake, they've lost their homes, they've lost someone they love. But I do wonder, I don't think there's any research uh, in a situation where children are at home, you know, with their family. Um, and I, I do wonder about if they will experience the level of anxiety we're assuming they will. So that, that's one piece of it in terms of that funding for that piece. But, you know, I, I wanna get back to what Kay was saying about literacy 
and regression. You know, I didn't know if maybe instead of, if we find out that kids may come back to school and within six weeks or a month might be fine in terms of um, their emotional regulation. If there's any way we could either high, hire additional staff, paraeducators, extend maybe part-time teachers, extend them to give them more time to, to, to really ramp up uh, the instruction that kids would need that they lost over the summer in terms of um, regression or just because remote learning you know, wasn't able to catch them up in terms of where they should be in terms of their grade level and, and, and also literacy. So anyway, that's just a thought it, in looking at funding and really where would the best expense, you know, where would, would it be best where we used funding to help I kids? Think, I think we're gonna definitely, um, we'll be working on that list. Um, and I would suggest if you have some, some uh, I'm gonna ask you to put them in a bullet point. Um, and send them okay. to Jim, that would be great. Yeah. But again, I, I just wanna say if anybody has any research in terms of what we know about kids returning to school and the emotional impact, because I, I just can't imagine we have any research because this has never occurred before. So I'd be curious to learn more about that. Well, we might have a little bit more of information as NFI and it would be yep. worth it. Maybe you could reach out to NFI and see if they've got anything. Yep. If yep. you have context there. Uh, that's Northeast Family Institute. Okay, um, very much appreciate this work. Um, uh, Mr. Secretary, we have a minute or, not really a minute, you know, we have three minutes. Um, I, looking at, if you could just talk to us a little bit about the administration's budget in education. And I'm just really out of the loop on that at this point in time. Is that something you or Brad could speak to? Yeah, I could, uh, but I'll, I'll, I made a note to make sure you have a copy of that. Um, yeah. My impression it was put together, I think Friday uh, with leadership, but um, the education piece of it, uh, what, I, what I put forward in there really conforms to um, what is our preliminary planning template document for reopening in the fall. That's the way I've sort of looked at it to Chloe's point. You know, we're trying to you know, certainly look at all the different funding sources that are available, um, but I think time is of the essence as well as the other variable. But the planning document identifies uh, five domains, one of which, uh, you know, is the sort of underlying public health guidance that will inform this, the, how, what the context of the classroom or school will look like. That's underway. Um, but I think the two of the five domains that uh, really identified pretty quickly where there's gonna be need for fu additional funding is the, um, um, the facilities area, you know, the, the sort of retrofitting of uh, classroom space, for example, nurses office, HVAC systems, that kind of thing. And the other domain um, up to, so each is a hundred million dollars, uh, the physical plan, another hundred million for continuity of learning that's the technology, distance learning systems, devices, PD, um, and then additional 10 million in uh, the last domain, which is the uh, social emotional support systems. But once again, this was put together very rapidly just to, I, I view it as a, a placeholder. Uh, there was no real detailed ability for us to get in and produce uh, numbers based on some sort of analysis or survey from the districts. I think That'll, that'll start to come forward as the planning uh, is underway. So this is not related to the information we're gonna to get tomorrow on the floor, this, the, the, uh, the first quarter. This, this is more related no, to- No, this is, this is about CRF yep. sort of planning, today's topic. I'm sorry to switch, switch it uh, on you, um, but we are gonna have the, this um, first quarter budget on the floor tomorrow. And I think there are a couple of things in education. Um, is that something you, you could speak to? I'm not, I don't have that in front of me right now. Um, I can, I can put that together, but I would just wait till tomorrow. I will say, <clears throat> similarly tomorrow, I'm in Senate Finance Committee talking about uh, these same issues and particularly the Ed Fund uh, situations. Okay. Kate, Kate, if you want, I'm happy to speak to a little bit of the um, appropriations proposal for Ed Fund. But you can wait for another time or if you want to say yeah. something now. Well, I see that we have Joyce on and pretty soon we're going to have um, 
uh, Nebi on. They'll be joining us shortly. Um, so we might want to just wait on that. Um, I appreciate the, the support from the community and um, helping us as we're into, into just a completely different world on, on funding um, and serving our students. So with that, I think we can probably end this part of the conversation. Um, we're going to switch. I don't know, Dan, this might be something that you might have some interest in. Oh, I think I've lost him, right? I just lose him, yeah. Um, we're gonna be starting the conversation on the Vermont State Colleges and the current, uh, uh, current study before the Appropriations Committee that Peter and I helped to work on a little bit this, this weekend. Uh, Peter Conlon and Peter Fagan. Um, so we can wait for uh, Nebby to come on. Um, Avery, you have, do you have a copy of the document? Um, yes, Nebby? I'll pull it up now. Yeah, we can have it ready to go. Um, and I think, Joyce, you're, you're there. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joyce. Oh, sure. And thank you for your time over the weekend. I'm sure you have, have nothing else to do during this time. And Ken, it's, it's, it's us excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Candice, we're going to pull up the document um, shortly that uh, we discussed, the document that you sent to us. Um, Let's, let's just first have a moment to talk to Joyce and, and Candace about uh, Joyce basically progress so far in appropriations and, and what, uh, what we will be. Oh, Candace says she's having audio issues. Okay. Um, maybe you could give us Joyce a sort of an update on, on where they are in appropriations related to this document. Sure. So the idea is that there would be a study that looks at the system of higher education in Vermont. And uh, when we first started working on this study, it was going to be uh, JFO hiring a consultant. The consultant would produce a report, presumably by January 15th. Um, then uh, I believe that Representative Webb sent our early draft, which was uh, a draft, <laughs> off to the New England Board of Higher Education. And they've had lots of experience with different states working on a similar kind of study. And their thought was that the study would receive much more prominence and would be um, embraced by a wider community if uh, the study were coming from a blue ribbon commission or what they're now calling a select committee. So the, the uh, proposal that we'll be looking at today is basically their draft that used, I think all of the points, many of the points that were in our original draft, um, but fleshes them out a bit more and has a nice phased in schedule so that the state would receive different parts of the study along a, a somewhat extended timeline. Uh, I believe the Appropriations Committee is waiting for this committee to, to weigh in on the proposal. Um, many people think that the current draft has a very large select committee. Uh, there would be many, many people involved. So uh, it, it might be helpful to try to slim down that committee just a bit. And that, I, I think also with that select committee, there's the option for us to, I believe this is gonna be on the floor tomorrow, but there's an option for us to do a friendly amendment that we could bring on Friday. Is that your understanding? Yes, on Friday, right. Okay, great. I think I saw Michael and I see Candace back again. Excellent. So um, uh, maybe, um, Avery, you could give uh, Candace or, or Michael um, the steering wheel, <coughs> the remote control, <laughs> co-host. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just ask um, which would be the best to give um, co-hosting permission to. Definitely Candace. 
And would that be Candice or Candice's iPad? Um, let's use just Candice. Okay, just one moment. All right, I'm sharing my um, Microsoft Word so that you can see the draft proposal. Thank you. Michael, would you like to sort of kick us off in reviewing? reviewing? Well, you know, Candace, I'll, I'll admit that I think uh, after handing it off to you um, and Joyce, you probably had your heads in it the most. So I'm happy to have you, uh, okay. yeah, lead out. Sure. So um, we, what we did was, in um, a lot of what we heard in discussion with Representative Webb and the Chair of Appropriations relative to the focus and the approach for this select committee. So you'll see that we've started off with a statement of purpose that acknowledges some of the challenges that Vermont is facing similar to other New England states. Um, and then focusing in on the elements that a select committee would um, lend their focus to, including opportunities, issues and challenges facing the institutions, the nature and role of systems and institutions within this environment, um, new innovative models to expand affordable learner centered workforce aligned credentials and degrees, and um, perhaps a re-envisioning of the state's post-secondary institutions and infrastructure as talent, innovation, entrepreneurship, et cetera, platforms, as well as anchors within their cities and towns and their communities. So I might have missed the beginning of the conversation. I was having trouble with some audio, which is why I have to join in my iPad as well. But um, we have gone, we have heard that the um, composition of the select committee most likely should be narrowed um, and made a bit smaller. But I think that's best left to you folks to decide who needs to be represented on the, the select committee. But we also propose that, that within the select committee would be a steering committee to provide leadership um, and hold additional responsibilities related to um, basically um, hiring and overseeing the work of a consultant, setting the timeline, um, considering the approach, whether it should be phased or not, et cetera as well as the possibility that there could be some subcommittees um, that would be sort of topic specific, um, such as program development or workforce alignment or governance, etc. So we wrote in some roles and responsibilities. Sorry, I'm just making a change here. Um, for the steering committee of the select committee, for the consultant, which would be hired by the steering committee through an RFP process and would be charged with a lot of the data analysis um, and recommendations related to governance systems, cost drivers, um, and evaluation of program offerings in alignment with the workforce. And then in, in discussions um, with Representative Webb and others, we propose some project management capacity offered by NEBI to help execute the timeline, manage the meetings of the committee, um, oversee sort of dissemination of meeting minutes, pu public comments, any other liaising that we might do. And then we further detailed areas of focus. Um, there are four areas of potential focus. The first being the financial sustainability of the system and its capacity to innovate to meet state goals. The second is how well the current structure promotes student success. The third being alignment with higher education and workforce development goals, um, policy frameworks and collaboratives. And then the fourth being 
um, alignment with the economy and emerging labor market needs. So we, um, we also discussed that there is the need for some short term solutions in addition for in addition to a framework for some longer term strategic thinking. So it could be that this committee works in multiple phases over the next six to 18 months. And then finally, we delineated some key areas in which the select committee's formal action plan um, would develop recommendations. So system redesign, government, governance, academic innovation, integration of campuses, residential campus sustainability, resources, and funding. Michael, Chair Webb, back. was there was there anything else you wanted us to speak to? I apologize, I missed the first moment of the call, call as well. So, um, no, that this this is this is really helpful. I think um, I, I'm apologizing to my committee that we're bringing them in so late, but but bear in mind that we just started this conversation. I think on Saturday or was it Sunday, Michael? <laughs> uh, it was late Sunday afternoon. Yes, late Sunday afternoon after a quick call on on Friday. So. Um, uh, we're, we're bringing this to the committee quite late. The appropriation committee is definitely asking us to weigh in on a couple of things. Um, one is the, uh, at the moment, um, Nebi has given us a, a list of, of potential people to participate. And um, for a small state of only 630,000, this seemed like a, a large representation. So um, one of the things they're looking for is perhaps a recommendation to reduce this number to something that's perhaps more manageable. And the other is to look at the timeline. And third, of course, is anything else that we see. Um, in the meantime, in relation to looking to the proposed, and I realize committee, I'm jumping way ahead right into this detail and everything, giving you a chance to think about this, but hang on, we're, we're on a really fast roller coaster here. Um, a couple of things coming forward. One is um, Dylan has been appointed to a task force called Vermont Forward. Is that right, Dylan, I think? Uh, from the Vermont State Colleges as one of the trustees. And um, we wanna make sure that somehow we incorporate the, the folks in that group along with, with this group. And another option that, that came to mind in talking with, with our ledge council, um, uh, Jim Demeray is the possibility of, could we use the State Board of Education um, in here uh, to reduce some of the members? And I, I don't know if, if uh, Michael or Candace or, or Joyce, you had a, a third, or, Anybody have a thought on where, if there's the ability to use our State Board of Education um, in this as well to reduce some of the, the members? Can, can I explain that? that yeah. Reasoning? Um, so uh, if you look at that list there, toward the bottom, you've got um, a number of bullet points that deal with, I think, engagement by various members of the uh, community. So you've got six reps of business industry, uh, reps of, of um, cities and towns, heads of Vermont organizations. Um, one way to address that possibly is, uh, you, you will remember the State Board of Education uh, in Act 46 went around the state and held meetings uh, to both inform and take input. Um, and that was a way of community engagement. And you're about to get this week or next week, S166, which is the bill from the Senate that reorganizes the responsibilities of the state board to lift their vision up more toward uh, thinking about uh, strategy and vision uh, for the state, but also community engagement. So um, one approach may be, although the COVID issues might impede this, would be to task the state board with being part of this process to uh, gather uh, community views and um, share information out to the community rather than having all these additional members members of the committee and have the state board report back to the uh, uh, select committee. That would help out for the bottom few board points. So the top ones, obviously, that wouldn't help so much, but in terms of, of the engagement piece, that could help. Michael, Candace, thoughts on that? 
Yeah, well, it's a, it's a really good point. And again, I think as we emphasized in some of our previous conversations, uh, some of you may have been party to those, but I think, you know, um, <clears throat> You know, our, I think our approach in that list there was to throw out some opportunities so that you could then tailor and size it to uh, the very factors that you've all, I think, cited here. Uh, you know, our, our goal was to be as inclusive as possible um, and um, to uh, find ways to, you know, as we described it yesterday, avoid giving any sort of group or key constituency the opportunity to say, well, we weren't consulted, therefore this is not valid. So, uh, but I think, you know, the suggestion that was just made was, uh, is a good one. You may be able to use sort of single contacts um, or, or participating members who by virtue of their work or their role or organization can serve as sort of a, a conduit or a funnel for expanded um, data and information in, into the process, you know, and, and I think as was just described uh, was, was a good example. So, you know, they might be able to hold other discussions with their groups and collaborators and pull that information back into the process. Um, uh, they might be able to use sort of, you know, standing activities of their organizations um, to, to do the same. So I, th I, th I think that could be a very good strategy for expanding that. Yeah. Um, Joyce, any, any thoughts? So that sounds good. And um, it's also true that we had talked about using maybe the, the State Chamber of Commerce as a point of reference for some of these representatives of business and industry. Um, so there may be other opportunities to, to use this similar single point of contact idea. Yeah. And, and uh, Chair Webb, I think we mentioned yesterday too, sometimes Nebby, you know, in our boards and commissions will sometimes form within the larger group, we may form a couple of subcommittees on areas that need particular focus and input and um, you know sometimes uh, that group could um, you know actually call its own witnesses for lack of a better word right and those witnesses are you know charged with being you know voices to represent key constituencies groups or to speak on key issues so you, you can sometimes you know it, it, you can't invite everyone to be on the committee but three either the, the, the hearings and the conversations of the whole or the subparts, you can create bandwidth where you can make sure that every voice is represented. Right. Um, Kathleen James says uh, our NEBI member, did you, I saw your hand up at one point. I, I took it down because I think I answered my own, own question. I was trying to sync up um, sort of the more immediate crisis facing the Vermont State College system and, and this year's presumed bridge funding with the different dates and timelines and the phases of the report. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it looks to me, I'm just, I've just been scrolling back and forth and it right. looks to me as though that's handled in phase one, deadline one. So thanks. Thank you for looking at that. Sarita Austin. Yep. Um, I'm wondering if it would make more sense to maybe have fewer members of the legislature on there and more members from labor and workforce development. You only have one person. And I think a big part of this kind of restructuring is looking at workforce development in Vermont and that transition, you know, after high school, post-secondary adult education. So that's just a thought. I think there. I think that the list of six six members of the General Assembly has been been brought up as well. So, so yes. Um, and also, I, I think Michael and Candace, I also sent you um, the, the uh, latest task force um, from the Vermont State Colleges um, th that uh, was just created yesterday. A way to uh, incorporate that or use that in a way so that we're not all working across purposes. We're actually. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, that was very helpful to have shared with us and uh, sort of fills out the broader context of the state. And um, 
in some of our conversations over the last couple of days, again, some of you were, were, were party to this discussion, um, you know, we did mention that it's not uncommon when sort of the question of the future of public uh, post-secondary education is brought to the forefront to have sort of multiple you know, efforts to answer that question. Obviously, you're leading a legislative um, supported effort. Um, it's very common for the system and the institutions and the governing board themselves to jump in and do their own iteration. <clears throat> and then you may sometimes even get outside groups, public policy institutes and other observers trying to do the same. Um, and I think, you know, part of the impetus behind this notion of a select committee was to, um, try to do what was possible to bring the system and uh, you know the, the whole of public higher education in Vermont into this process so that it wouldn't be seen by respective groups as just being a legislature's approach and the VSCs just being the VSCs take on things. You know, the more inclusive you can be, the more the greater is the opportunity for to say for you to say this is a statewide inclusive process that really brings together all of the people um, and thereby hopefully gives added legitimacy. And um, I think what is described in um, VSC Forward is really important. And if you can find a way to, you know, in terms of representation on this select committee that you're proposing, if you can find a way to bring in the representatives directly from VSC Forward um, and help them to see that, you know, this is the goal of what you're doing is to try and build on the work that they're uniquely qualified to do uh, as the system itself with their inside knowledge and experience and history and all that, that you want their work to be a conduit into this broader state um, discussion. And, and the real purposes of that is so that you can help them build greater ownership, investment in, involvement in, and focus on the core matters that they're facing. So I think, you know, I think there's an opportunity to do that. You know, I think it's going to have you'll, you'll definitely have to work to sort of work to integrate that and, and build the understanding so that they understand how your effort is going to complement theirs. But I think there is an important opportunity to do that. They needn't be seen as sort of competing or, or disparate uh, activities. And I think with the right leadership and effort and, and uh, strategy, you can s help them be very complementary and, uh, you know, very, um, you know, synergistic in many ways. So. Um, let's also remember that you, not only is there a select committee, but there's also a steering committee, which is a, a, a smaller group. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, no, that's right. And I think uh, at least our conversations of recent days was that, um, you know, um, select committees bring together lots of very busy people, many of whom have got, you know, day jobs that are ultra consuming, and you're going to ask for their additional support. And it might be good to have a chair and a co-chair and maybe a few other people that are designated as sort of a steering committee. And they might just be able to sort of tend to the, to the management of the process and to make some of these decisions around process. Um, in a more timely and compact fashion than if you had to sort of consult with the whole of the group. So if at, if at the outset you sort of say that the, the chair and the co-chair and a small group of steering committee, which is again roughly representative of the whole of the group, uh, may be called upon to, you know, sort of help manage the process sort of day to day and uh, make some decisions, then I think if you get people on board with that early, then that can be an efficient way to, to, to most effectively manage this, you know, time consuming process. Is that consistent with what you had sort of thought about, uh, yeah. Chair Webb? Okay. Yeah, I, I think so, at least for me. <laughs> um, Joyce, I don't know, do you wanna speak to that? Uh, no, that sounds good. And I, th I think given our short time frame, it's going to be really important to be able to make decisions quickly. So uh, I think the steering committee is a great idea. Yeah, Peter Conlon. Uh, so, Kate, your warning that the legislature is very bad at making lists always yeah. rings in my ears when we have <laughs> when we are confronted with something like this. Yeah. Uh, so, just a couple of questions. One, um, is it our committee's responsibility to be the ones to pare this list down or come up with a list before Friday? And and two, uh, question really for Dylan about how much overlap 
there is between this proposed list and uh, who's on VSC forward. Maybe Dylan would be prepared to speak to us a little bit about VSC forward. And, and again, bearing in mind that the VSC has got to do their work. They've got to really drill down into their specific um, issues, concerns, what got them there, use of their facilities, all of that. And I, I think our role is to be probably uh, a larger, more state view that um, might ask some more difficult questions. Um, how about how about just the timing and process, Kate, in terms of this language in a bill? Um, I think they would really appreciate us having a recommendation to them um, by Friday, and um, I I don't have a committee member. I don't have a committee scheduled. I'm looking to see if I could do something on Thursday or perhaps Friday morning, um, but I would see it as being a, 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 an amendment that that we, we, would, we would add and it would be very helpful actually if I could just get a small group to, to work on that. I think doing it as a committee is gonna be a little bit of a challenge as we know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I guess I would say I, I, would, I especially think so because really delving into this area is something that our committee hasn't done a whole lot of. Right. Know, or the legislature as a whole has not really dealt into the running of our state colleges. So this is- right. I see this is pretty challenging. Yeah, we've been more of a pre-K-12 committee, haven't we? Serena Austin. Yep. Um, I'm just wondering if the regional group that we had the presentation, the PowerPoint, if they if they would be in this group. I know we had talked to them about possibly advising, helping us out with this situation. Is this where they would be included or would this group develop something and maybe they would react to it? I'm not sure who you're referring to. Remember the regional, the New England regional group that presented us that PowerPoint? Yeah, they're, um, um, they're here with us right now. Okay, so would they be on room. this committee? They do have a role. Maybe you could review that again. Okay. Yeah. I'm they're, sorry, I might have missed yeah. it. So yeah. <laughs> they do have a role? Yes, in project management. They, they we, okay. we asked them very, very nicely if they would, would help and they said Great. that they would. We are members of a, of a New England state consortium. Um, and so they, they are proving their value right now. <laughs> for sure. Thank you. Um, Joyce, so is that your understanding? They are looking, um, um, and, that, that that's what they're looking for from us is feedback on timeline and feedback on on the um, the select committee is the primary thing they're looking for understanding yes that for the most part um, this is this is a pretty comprehensive uh, approach that we're taking that um, that allows allows for a fairly robust conversation um, with stakeholders and with experts and, and facilitated by a professional. And there's money in here somewhere for that. Um, I don't think it's in this one, but that's something that appropriations will be adding. Yes, that's my understanding. And of course, if the committee has other thoughts about the proposal as currently written, that would be welcome as well. But those are the two big areas where, where the uh, House Appropriations Committee knows that they need help. Yeah, okay, this must be something. Um, okay, just just to, as a, to the committee, I, I do wanna apologize for how late this is, this is coming to us and the, the fact that we've had you know, precious little time to, um, to engage in it. Um, this came from the, I think on Friday, uh, we got the draft proposal and immediately contacted Nebby and just started um, trying to work on, on bringing them into the conversation. So if people are feeling like, why, why are we getting this right now? It's because um, we really, really just started to work on it and uh, spent, spent some time over the weekend coming up with this. And I will tell you that when I, I think I sent them an email Friday afternoon and by um, Sunday, they had a, a, a pretty extensive proposal. And I just grabbed Peter Conlon um, to help as well as Peter Fagan and uh, Mike Marcotte um, to work with Kitty as well, Kitty Toll, 
um, in, an, in a meeting with some of the appropriations folks to, to try to figure out what to do here. So um, the reason this is all coming so late and the reason that you're hearing about it right now is that's how it went down. And welcome to the legislature. Uh, as we're trying to create a new budget in the middle of a pandemic and when we can't even meet and catch each other in the halls. This is an example of uh, how complicated it can be. Normally these conversations, plus we usually meet five times a week or four times a week. Right now we're not doing that. So um, it's been very, very complicated and I appreciate your patience in this um, and for uh, not contacting you all on Sunday to have a quick meeting. <laughs> Um, so I don't know, Peter Conlon, this is usually when I turn to you to come up with some. Oh, yeah, I see, I just gonna say, I, I see Dylan's hand is still up. Oh, good. I don't see it up. Dylan, please. Yeah. Oh, can you hear me? I have two, I have two pieces of technology coming here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Thank you, Dylan. My, my apologies. I haven't upgraded Zoom yet, so I've got my phone going and my computer. And I'm worried that pretty sure I'm going to short a circuit here in my house. But um, to uh, Peter's question earlier about the Vermont State College's System Forward Initiative, uh, I, I view these as two very distinct things. Um, the uh, panel that has been pulled together by the interim chancellor uh, is made up of folks specific to the Vermont State College's system. Um, I'm very pleased to have an opportunity to work with that group which will include members from the chancellor's office, but then particularly a focus on members from the campus communities, including representatives of uh, the different faculty and staff unions, um, a student representative and others. And that's, that's more for us as a system. And keep in mind, we are separate from the University of Vermont in terms of our public higher education investments in the state. Uh, we're gonna be looking at the Vermont State Colleges system, uh, both as a whole system and also the campuses to address things such as program duplication, um, ensuring access and quality of programs, uh, trying to distinguish the characteristics of member institutions. Um, and you know, there is a charge more broadly about uh, identifying the sustainable strategies that will allow us to thrive in the future, but also looking at things like reconfiguring the system to achieve organizational, financial governance and accreditation goals. So, that is a separate piece, but the legislators look here, and if I understand the intent of this correctly, is much broader because it's more about our total public higher education investment in the state. And I think that convening it at this level with some of the representatives outlined in this proposal is distinct from what the Vermont State Colleges system is doing. And I think it's a real opportunity. So I certainly support this concept um, and from the point of view as an education committee member, I think this is one of the most important things we can do because certainly we know the world of post-secondary education is gonna face some real pressures, particularly if there are more disruptions resulting of COVID-19. And so I think that taking this look now, while we have um, both an abundance of uncertainty, but also an abundance of federal resources and other resources coming into the state, it's the right time to do it. And if we want to get serious in the 21st century about how we deliver post-secondary and being a leader um, for modeling how a state can transform its system and its public higher education investment, then I think that this is a good part of the strategy to get there. So I'll just leave it there. Um, but if anyone does want to catch up about the Vermont State Colleges Initiative, I'd be happy to do so as we get working. Thank you. Um. Dylan, do you have any recommendations? I'm looking at this list, and I, I also am aware that um, that even though this is a large committee, that we have a steering committee, and we want to we want the steering committee to have a pool to draw from um, in, in putting them to work. But looking at the list right now of uh, folks from the Vermont State Colleges, it's two from the Board of Trustees, the interim chancellor president from one of each of the colleges and then faculty members. Um, that's just VSC. And then we have two from UVM. Um, wondering if you have any thoughts on that, that list, particularly as it compares to Vermont Forward. How long, Vermont Forward is only, only going until mid-August, is that correct? 
Yeah, so we have a shorter term horizon here to make system specific recommendations. Yeah. You know, I, I think the one piece of feedback I will provide to this body, because it's separate from the governing board of the Vermont State Colleges system, is that when we talk about transforming and changing, having the voices from the campus communities, I think is very important. And I'm not sure I have a specific recommendation of the composition here, but I do personally feel a strong um, desire that we should have representation of faculty and staff um, in a proportion that allows some of those really creative ideas uh, to come from the bottom up. So to the extent that we look at the makeup here, um, I recognize that there's a hierarchy in higher education and so forth, but I would encourage um, those ideas from the communities to be there. And you know, the other point here and a question just for us to consider, we've um, certainly seen our state board of education and many school boards include student representation. And I'm not sure that this is the place where we need that, but um, certainly it's just a consideration to flag for the committee, should there be a student representative or student representatives um, and I know that we need to keep a small or uh, functional group for this type of work, but nevertheless, it's always important to consider all the options as we weigh this. Okay. I'm, um, I don't think that we're going to be able to go through this and pull this list together um, in this committee meeting right now. Um, I'm inclined to think maybe getting together a small group, perhaps. Um, to work with Peter Fagan and um, Marcotte um, as well to uh, review this list might not be a bad idea. Um, see if we can we can bring it down. Um, bearing in mind the steering committee is only five to eight members. So Joyce, what did we figure? This was about forty people. <laughs> right. So I counted thirty-four uh, down to the representatives from specific cities, towns, or regions. So starting with that bullet and two more bullets, we have an un, unspecified number of people. So I've got 34 plus the number that's unspecified. So that gets up to be 40, 45 without too much trouble, which seems like a very large group. And yeah. I, I, what I'm wondering what I'm wondering is, um, are we seeing this? Are we, just I guess I'm thinking of the relationship between the steering committee and this uh, extensive pool, uh, resource pool, um, in working with the consultant. Um, is, is it is it bad to have it that big? If it's a pool rather than perhaps a it's a pool that we're drawing from. Right, so maybe Nebby wants to talk to this, but it seems to me there are lots of decisions that have to be made quickly with a consultant who wants to get to work. Yeah. And um, if the steering committee has sufficient power to make those decisions without going through the entire select committee, maybe that can work. Um, I did talk briefly to Jim Page, who is doing the short-term financial study of the Vermont State Colleges system. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been part of many of these groups, and he was quite adamant that you don't want a, a very big group to be responsible for a, a report of this sort because the, the recommendations of the group may get watered down. So in order mm -hmm. to get yeah. full support of the group, you have to sort of um, you know, meet in the middle and, and maybe that means that you're not taking a hard position on, on some points. So he, he was quite certain that, that we ought to try to uh, whittle down the size of this select committee. Okay. Are folks comfortable with me uh, working with Peter Fagan and Marcotte on this? Um, or perhaps, um, are, are, are folks comf comfortable with that? Or do you wanna be part of a, a small group that looks at this list? So I just gave you a question. So um, Kathleen? 
Um, Kate, just to say, I'll take a look at it uh, when we're done here and send you some thoughts. Okay, great. That sounds like a really great idea. Can other folks do that as well? Take yes. a look at the list. Jay, as, as a person yep. who lives in the community where the Vermont Technical Colleges are, did you have something to say? Uh, no, I think I'll just be in touch with Dylan and make sure that um, I'm following along closely. I do appreciate, though, you're asking. Yeah, and if you have some thoughts as well on this, that would be great. Um, and I'll, I'll try to pull that together. And um, Kate, Yeah. Kate, I, I just have a, a, a question. Yes, please. Uh, so, um, uh, well, first of all, I think the history of, of this document in front of us was that it really began in appropriations with a list of roles and responsibilities and whatnot for a consultant to look at. Mm -hmm. um, I think you had the very um, bright idea of bringing in Nebi to get some thoughts from them and that they said, you know, this is really work that should come out of a select committee, out of a single consultant, but with the help of a consultant. Um, and I wonder, I'm just sort of wondering because this, this time crunch is very stressful yeah. Especially when narrowing down a list, um, yeah. I wonder if if and this is this has really been kind of an appropriations generated idea. If maybe what needs to happen first is just get the consultant moving, um, and then sort of uh, reporting back to a team to be determined later when we're back here in August. I just throw that out as an idea that that maybe we can discuss with, with those folks as a way to get out from under this this time crunch for naming this list of, of the select committee. Interesting. Um, Michael or Candace, thoughts? Um, well, yeah, no, that's a really good question. I think, um, you know, it, it would be helpful to know sort of, you know, how you, um, as uh, either a committee or as legislative leaders from specific committees, including appropriations, uh, the aforementioned, um, will be sort of uh, continuing to work uh, over the, uh, the, the coming weeks. But I think, um, you know, you may, you may need to make the uh, consultant engagement decision prior to the full composition of the board, because that, of course, will take a little bit of time, one, to whittle it down and determine it, and then two, to, you know, engage engage all the people and sort of bring them up to speed and get the board moving. And you'll, you'll want to, I think, maximize your time of analysis and sort of benchmark and table setting so that when the select committee comes together for the first time, you're able to put out a lot of the sort of, you know, assumption setting and, and shared data that will undergird the conversation going forward. So I think that does make sense. I, I think I got Peter's uh, point is that is that sort of what you're suggesting, Peter? Yes, we're just in this sort of unique circumstance where the appropriations committee um, is going to put out a phase one budget that just covers kind of the first three months of the year, the fiscal year, and they want to do that Friday. But then we're going to come back in August and put together the rest of the budget. And it just seems to me we could, act, while they split the budget up, we could split up this work over those two phases as well, where. Mm -hmm. Phase one budget includes the, getting the consultant rolling and uh, the remaining budget work in August would include the naming of the select committee. Yeah, you might want to you might want to put um, <clears throat> if, if I were thinking about it, you might want to put the naming of the consultant and some of that initial work in the first and probably work to include the designation and um, engagement of the select committee members so that that, like I say, I think you want to get that set sooner than later. You may not actually have them meeting and in full work, but uh, you might want to pull the the at least the naming and composition of the the group into the first phase, if possible. But what, you all can figure that out based on what's feasible and sort of your time frames. So there's the thought of um, appointing the steering committee in phase one. <laughs> Uh, if possible, I think that would de would definitely make sense. Um, but again, you you all will be able to figure that out. I think we're happy to consult with you on that. Well, we need we need you to help us figure this out. Let's just be very clear. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, yeah. So, you know, however you split it between phase one, three month budget, and then what goes beyond that. Well, I think we'll want to just make sure that um, you don't leave too much until August so right. that um, the process sort of is just starting up and then it's really, you know, sort of starting to, to, to run properly by September, at which point you're a lot closer to your presumed sort of deadline for getting this work done than you'll probably want to be. So I think, you know, just might want to think about what we need to front end load to sort of set the table and get things moving to the extent that whenever you hit phase two, um, there's not a big learning curve and lots of other stuff that you need to complete to get everyone up and engaged. So, you, you know, we're happy to conf confirm confer with you about that more and think about it from the standpoint of project management. Um, I think those are good points. Yeah, I found something about at least maybe hitting some of these areas, but maybe not having it fully, fully fleshed. So yeah. we're gonna have maybe at least one person from here, one person from there, one person from, from something else. And then we can flesh that out as we move along is another option. A question, Joyce, where does, is there anything we could, we could put onto the joint fiscal committee or, or am I just out of my element um, during the time between June and, and um, August? So I'm not sure I can answer that question. I, I think maybe we need to, to consult with them. Um, I do know that they are gonna have lots on their plate because there yeah. will be plenty of COVID issues that are still swirling around. And of course, changes in the guidance about how to spend COVID money and uh, many requests for that money. So I, I don't think I can answer that. Yeah, I, I, yeah, they are gonna be busy, <laughs> let's, let's be clear. Um, can I mention a mechanical yeah. um, I'm just wondering about, um, usually when we hire consultants, we go through a competitive, competitive bidding process and that's done by an agency. Yeah. Uh, we've got the mechanics for that. So I'm just thinking about how that process would work. It wouldn't be the steering committee, I don't think, um, that would put out the bid. It'd probably be the agency of education or administration. We just, I think those mechanics have to be worked through in terms of how that would that would work. Um, right. My only experience is working with the agency of education as as, a, as uh, finding a consultant through an RFP, um, and I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure who that would be. Or well, agency is part of this working group, so maybe you could task the agency with that. With that. Yeah. I'm not sure. The Ways and Means Committee seems to like to uh, put that work onto JFO, which is something we haven't done previously, it goes through, through the agency. Yes, and when, when I was talking to the Appropriations Committee about this study, uh, they had asked us to put out some feelers as to uh, would there be any consulting groups out there who would be available to do such a study in a short amount of time. And so we have done a little bit of that work to, to reach out to various groups to see if they would handle this, this kind of a study. Um, so we have started tiptoeing down that path. So, so is it possible to um, give that to JFO? Give that, um, I mean, who's, whose budget does this come out of? Right, so it would be possible to give it to JFO. I know that Steve Klein would prefer that we not be the, the group that is in charge of the contract because it is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. uh, we were hoping that Nebby might be able to help us in uh, drafting an RFP and uh, you know dealing with the process of choosing the consultant, but that's all up to you folks. Um. That would be great. It's still a matter of who who's going to who who's in charge of it, <laughs> right? Um, so if we give it to one of the agencies, then that's administration. Yes. Okay, that's another thing to be thinking about. My only experience really is the agency of education. I don't have other experience to, that I'm drawing from. Okay, right, so JFO, JFO has done other education contracts in the past. Certainly the, the PICAS report came through a JFO um, RFP process. 
Uh, that's the one that comes to mind and they've done many more as well. So if, if it went through JFO, if you had the support of NEBI, is that something, would that make it a little bit easier rather than making an administrative RFP? That would certainly help us, yes. Yeah. So um, Candace and, and Michael, is that something that you could you could help them with as well? Yeah, no, absolutely. Happy to do that. <clears throat> we do a number of RFP processes, so we're happy to help with that. We've got colleagues with some good experience in that regard. I, I would personally prefer to have it through JFO than than um, the agency. Okay, why don't, so let's just put, now that we've completely solved the uh, list, let's go to the timeline. <laughs> Caleb has his hand up. Oh, Caleb, yes, excuse me. Thank you. Caleb Elder. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I'm just looking at the documents uh, as well, and, and thank you for scrolling down on that. Um, I, some of what's on here seems worthy um, of a committee, but it also seems to coincide a lot with the chancellor, the former chancellor's white paper from last summer. Um, and some of the goals about examining uh, kind of the direction of the campus seems to be very similar to the work that led up to NVU, which was, of course, just in its second year. Uh, I'm a little concerned about the perception uh, of re-engaging a process like that without somehow acknowledging that it was just done and that... Um, and that you know, former Chancellor Spaulding has been telling us we need more money, and and this doesn't really even address bridge funding any place I can see. So I just want to make sure that this bill, number one, isn't just look sort of like, wait, didn't we just do all that visioning? Isn't NVU the results? Uh, <laughs> what about th that kind of work product? And also, what about that white paper, which isn't even twelve months old? Couldn't that tell us a lot? It seems to me our problem is a is a lack of money. And if this group takes too much effort, not just focusing on the money, it, it, it could be um, seen as a waste of time. Maybe Candace or Michael can help us with that. Remember, we're not just, we have financial problems, but we also have a demographic problem and we also have a changing face of education. And we have a few other things that are contributing to the problem, the reasons why we're having some problem with funding. Right. But, but that's very much addressed in those documents I'm talking about that all, all of those problems have been um, they're not new this year they've been front and center for you know a couple of years and we've got a lot of very recent work product uh, addressing them that we have not acted upon because we've not funded it. Chair Webb could I say something about the bridge funding? Yes please. So JFO has a separate contract that's been underway for maybe six weeks with Jim Page, who is the former chancellor of the University of Maine system. And he was tasked with looking at the, the specific financial reports from each of the Vermont State College's campuses together with the chancellor's office financial reports. And um, probably early next week, he will come out with his report that talks about how much funding does the Vermont State College's system need in this current fiscal year and also how much bridge funding would they need next year in order to maintain operations. Uh, his report will be looking at various scenarios for enrollment. So do we expect that enrollment starting in the fall will be down 5% or down 15% or down 25%. So uh, that report will be really informative in terms of what do the numbers look like? What do the campuses need? Um, the treasurer's office is also doing a parallel report, which, which is looking at exactly the same issues. What do they need this year? What will they need in, in uh, the academic year 2021? So both of those reports will be coming out. And I think that was, those two reports together will, will address the issues of the funding. So this, this new study was meant to say, let's look at all of higher education in Vermont, not just the Vermont State Colleges system, but all of higher education. And let's think about how the higher education system is serving the needs of Vermonters 
in terms of what's the workforce look like, where are the gaps, uh, who are we training, uh, what's the you know, graduation rate, all of, all of those things in a big picture. So not just Vermont State Colleges, but use what we know about Vermont State Colleges together with um, you know, the University of Vermont and the private institutions in the state to get a bigger picture of where we are and where we want to go. Thank you. Michael or Candace, do you have anything else to add to Representative Elder's concern, yeah. which, is, which is, a, is a fair one. We don't want another report on the shelf. You bet. Candace, any thoughts? I'm, I've got a few, but Candace, do you have anything to share? I think my, my only response. Are you hearing two of me? Yes. Yeah. We are. My response would be that um, I would hope that this larger committee, select committee, would take into consideration many of the reports and analyses that have happened in the last couple of years and use those as building blocks and not duplicate them, um, but you know, cite and refer to them. Um, because I, I agree, I think they're there is the possibility that um, this could, like you say, be another report on the shelf um, when there has been a lot of uh, attention to the sort of longer term issues facing Vermont. And in addition to those sort of system efforts, there are also workforce development and other sort of um, economic or economy wide groups like the Vermont Talent Pipeline Project, Advance Vermont, the State Workforce Board that have been doing a lot of analysis too about how to build out better education and career pathways. So I think if, if we can structure this effort to be one that allows um, all of those in initiatives to be plugged in um, and represents sort of statewide collation, that would be, that would be a, a a goal and a, and a positive outcome. Yeah, th that's great. And I would just add, I think I think Representative Miller makes a really critical point, and it may be that we need to uh, fine tool some of the language uh, here to get to both of his points. The first of which is, you know, you don't want to be redundant here. You don't want, and you don't want to not acknowledge or benefit from the significant work that has been done. And I think even in the proposed work of VSA Forward. DSC forward will be done. You know, I think the goal is to build upon it with a broader statewide perspective. And uh, you know, the point about funding is key, and maybe that um, needs to be more specifically uh, stated. I think we 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 mentioned in one of the key bullet points of you know prescribed outcomes of this uh, process is to come up with a resource and a funding plan. And I think that is both dollars as well as funding processes. And I think we specify a strategic investment framework as well as performance-based uh, funding models that could be considered to figure out how to further drive, you know, the progress and the performance um, that, uh, that, are, that are needed. So, and I think Joyce spoke well to the, the broader nature of what's trying to be accomplished here. So, you know, insofar as we need to retool some of this language, I think that would make sense to, to capture those critical points. Yeah, I wonder if maybe, and I appreciate Joyce, your, your uh, response on that. I, I wonder if it's a matter of changing the name of the committee, uh, removing the word public, um, because if you really look at the bullet points under there, they're not specific to the public schools. And I, I think to Joyce's point, this, this is a trend that is broader than the public schools. But, but if that indeed is the case, of course, the inclusion or exclusion of the word public is very important, but maybe we're talking about something broader than that describes. Um, Kathleen uh, and then Sarita, and then I wanna see if we can, we can figure out if we wanna make some changes to some of this language or perhaps can talk with them, um, talk with a few folks afterwards. Um, Kathleen. And then Serena. Joyce, did you have, I just wanted to jot them down. Um, to Caleb's point, I, I just wanted to say these are the, these are all the great reports. <laughs> 
that I've been working through just in response to the recent um, presentation that Nebi did. Um, and they're all very, very relevant. So I, I think it will be very important that we build on what we've already got. Um, I knew the consultant was doing a financial um, analysis. Um, I think I did not know that Treasurer Pierce was also doing one. Did you say those, those were both due um, in June? Right. Am I? Yes, I'm on. Um, yes. So I'm not sure about the timing of Treasurer Pierce's report. I know that she and her office have been working diligently on that report. Um, and the consultant was, was tasked with doing an independent report just so that everyone was sure that the numbers lined up properly. Um, so I've, I've been most in contact with Jim Page in order to be sure that his report is coming uh, probably early next week. It's possible that the treasurer's report will come out a few days before that. I, I just can't talk to that for sure. Great, thanks. Do we shoot for a, a group of 20? Just trying to give us some boundaries. Anybody? Bueller? No. Nope. Um, Larry, is that in response to what I just said? Yes. Yes, okay. 20 is too many. So I assume will... the point is, is that 20 is much less than what's being proposed. 45. Is... <laughs> wow. Uh, I, I, Bear in it, mind, we have two. We have two committees working here. Right. To defend it, I think one of the reasons to have a larger committee, um, assuming twenty is still considered large versus what is already being looked at, is so that you can have effective subcommittees targeting different areas. Too confusing. Duplicative. You mean duplicative with the Vermont State Colleges Task Force? Well, I disappeared too. <laughs> so I think, uh, uh, Chair Webb, I mean, I think, um, you know, you really need to think of who needs to be there. Right. Um, then you need to think of who you want to be there. And then you can right size some of those numbers just to, to deal with whatever you think is the optimal number. Um, you know, there's no right or wrong answer. You want to probably err a little bit towards inclusiveness with the assumption that not everyone will show up every time you pull people together and you always want to look like you've got a good group. So, oh boy. Um, can, I don't, can you hear me? I, I'm struggling. Yep. Um, I can. I'm not sure. I seem to be having problems. I don't know if you. Am I making? Can, can people hear me or not? Kate, you're coming through. I can loud hear and clear. you. Oh, okay. Yes. There we go. So, can we say we need someone from the governor's office? We need someone from the. Do we need someone from the general assembly? We need someone from the the, the state colleges. We need the Secretary of Education. We need commerce. Um, we need business and industry. We need probably some someone from the, the, the town. We probably need something from all of these. Is there any group that people would be inclined to knock out? And then we can adjust numbers based on, on that. One thing I think that we could do is double up. In other words, we've got state representatives who are also on the boards of trustees and That's from different point. parts of Vermont. So, you know, if we could, I, I haven't heard one person strongly support having legislators on this. So maybe those who are on there can fill dual roles. That was actually- I agree, Peter. That was the conversation and as I would say, upstairs in appropriations as well in the meeting is, is do we need legislators on it? No. Larry says no. Kate, uh, yeah. Oh, Sarita, I'm sorry. Yes. That's okay. I'm just wondering about the process for getting funds for the consultant. 
Um, Don't worry about that. We'll, you know, that's, well, that's, also just, is there a way to fast track that? Because I think I agree Sarita, so much with-, that, with That's appropriations, Sarita. That's appropriations. Don't worry about that. That's not ours. They'll figure that out. No, no, but what I'm asking, Kate, is how long is that process to get the consultant on board? Because I really agree with what Peter said in terms of getting a consultant on board and then having them help help us or whoever, you know, create a process to get to the outcome that we want. So that's all I want to say. I just really support trying to get a consultant who has done this a lot and has a lot of skills and experience doing this. And that's when Nebby and, and JFO are going to work on that as well. Right. Yeah. So we are, we're not appointing anybody, fortunately. Right. I just know if we could fast track it. Well, that's what, why we're passing something this week. Okay. It's, it's done. It doesn't happen until this is done. Okay. Um, I'm happy to, if people want to, uh, Larry, yes, in my yeah, what about a, What's the appropriation? Has anyone discussed the appropriation for 40 members or 20 members or 34 members? Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm just baffled at the amount of people here that you're going to be needed to come to some decision on what we're going to do. I, I can't. I, th I think it a lot of these just doesn't come. It, it just doesn't make sense to me. A lot wouldn't get paid. It's really the cost of the consultant. That's the biggest concern. And that's at least a hundred thousand according to. Um, I want to, I want to, given that we're out of out of time, I would like for everybody to send me um, some an email on thoughts about this uh, select committee. Um, if we could quickly look at time again, I'm having a little bit of trouble on my participant list, and it, for some reason things aren't showing up quite the way they're supposed to. So, um, if I'm missing somebody, um, Larry, could you help? and call on them if I'm missing a hand up? Yeah, you're good. There's no hands up that I can see right now. Okay, great. Um, so looking at the timeline, and this is the timeline that, that there was some conversation the other day um, about breaking it up into, um, into phases. And these are the phases that I'm I'm fine with the phases. Anybody else? <laughs> Since I can't, oh, there now I can see hands. Like Shane, I assume that that doesn't. That's just sort of it's a potential. Right. One we, it's not like that has to be put into a bill, does it? Joyce, does that go into the bill? So it was my understanding that this proposal would go into the bill. Uh, and I could be wrong about that. Maybe Jim has an idea. Um, so I'm having lunch as I talk to you. <laughs> um, no, I, I, think, uh, I think having the phases, the way this is set up, it's uh, potential phases. Um, but I think you want to have more definition around phases if you want them. Which, which suggests to me you want phases in the bill, so you have right. different, different deliverables. I agree with calling for deliverables, which it does with the interim reports that are due on certain dates. Yeah, Kate. Yes. Uh, Caleb has his hand up. Caleb. Thanks. Um, yeah, I just I, I at this point the phases I think are a little too much in the weeds for me. I. I tend to agree with Larry that I, I don't think that I don't see a point to this just yet. Um, if for me, I, I can't really have an opinion on it until I know is this about Vermont State Colleges? Or is this about college in New England and Vermont, both of which are important. But to me, Vermont State College is the 
much greater emergency that needs all the focus and all the tri triaging and all the resources right now. So if I wasn't sure this is really about VSC, it's hard to support. And if I feel it's too duplicative of VSC work that's happened, not to mention the new group that we hear Dylan's on, it just seems a little much. Uh, anyway, it, it, so I, I, I need to know kind of a little more what is this um, for in terms of addressing it? And is it going to be VSC specific? Um, I'd say the answer is no. And I think just given the time, I'm going to suggest that folks take an opportunity to read over the draft proposal because I think some of those questions are answered in there in relation uh, to. I have yeah. read it. Okay. So this may, so this. I don't think, I don't think we can get to, I don't know, does someone want to respond to Caleb? <laughs> Madam Chair, so this is Dylan. Yeah, who was that? Was that Joyce? This, that was, this that is was Dylan. Joyce. I, I, oh, I'm sorry. This is Dylan, if you can hear me. Yes. Sorry, I'm just having some technology issues today. It must be the, the new Zoom version or something, but I, I don't, I'm not here to rebut Caleb's comments, but because you asked for a response, um, I will say that given the significant impacts of COVID-19 disruptions on public higher education, um, while I don't disagree that the recent news has more focused on the Vermont State College's sustainability, I think that all states would be wise to be examining the current public configuration of systems because um, there are likely going to be some outcomes that will impact all public institutions. And in this case, that would include UVM. And I also just want to remember that we have the Vermont Students Assistant Corp, which provides that financial support for students, which is also part of our public higher education expenditure. So um, I'll, I'll leave that with you just for some thought and contemplation as we put down our thoughts and share them with the chair. Right. So if folks could send me their thoughts um, on this document, that would be great. I'll see what I can do. Um, I'm probably gonna try to pull something together either tomorrow or Friday morning. Um, if anyone would like to help participate on a small group in terms of looking at this. Um, as you know, lists are not my favorite thing to work on. Um, but nonetheless, when you're creating a group, you've got to create a list, so. Can I make one suggestion um, in terms of thinking about the list? Um, maybe divide the thinking into uh, people who will make decisions versus people who will give input. So people who will give input to the committee, you can have a short list of people to make decisions as on the steering committee and they separately can collaborate with whoever you want them to collaborate with to get input. Um, that's the way I think of pairing it down a bit and keeping it focused. <clears throat> I think that's a really good point. I think that's what the large list is, is it certainly for, uh, to keep in mind people that could provide input. And I think we want all of them to be providing input. Chair Webb, could I please say something about the timing and, and why we have the phased timeline? Yes, please. <laughs> So when we first started thinking about this process, the Appropriations Committee wanted a full report, the final report by January 15th. And as we sorted through the issues that had to be addressed in this process, we realized that it's really way too much for any consulting group to, to finish all of this work by January 15th. So then the question was, could we get useful information for uh, attacking some of the problem by January 15th, and then allow the consulting group to, to extend their analysis into other issues that would extend um, you know, into summer of next year and maybe even through December of next year. So that's the reason why we now have a phased timeline, just to break up the work and to get some of the uh, more urgent pieces available sooner. And to recognize we didn't need all of it by January 15th as well. Yes, yeah. correct. Yeah. Thank you, Joyce. So, uh, Kate, just speaking of timelines and the yeah. timeline we're on and the fact that it's, it's two, 
I think your idea of people sending you thoughts is probably the best way forward at this point. I don't think we're going to decide anything here and now since, no. you know, I've been aware of this since Monday and I'm still digesting it with everything else that's going on. Um, so I think that's, that's a good way to go. I think, I also think that <laughs> the idea of dealing with a long list is giving me a headache. And so maybe a smaller group dealing with that. Yeah, Peter Fagan and approach seems to have a very strong interest in this. Kitty does as well. Um, Mike Marcotte over in um, Commerce and maybe a select committee to select the select committee. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Might might be a good might be a good approach, but we're probably not going to solve it today. Correct. Let's agree that we're not solving this today. <laughs> we have plenty of time. We have until Wednesday, um, otherwise, uh, to have input. And, and I do think, um, Kate, and maybe I'll, I I might since I'm supposed to be the liaison to approach, I think the questions about money and is this really gonna go anywhere if that includes $150,000 for a consultant, are we doing per diems? And uh, just before we get too ahead of ourselves, make sure approach is still wanting to go in this direction. Um, now, that, now that they've had some time to digest it as well. This wasn't their original idea, right. having a committee, they wanted to just do a consultant. I, I, I would say that when we spoke the other day, the three members from appropriations were interested in this model. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. And also saw this as a really significantly important undertaking for the state of Vermont. Yeah. Okay, if we could get back to that, we could take the document down. Now that we've solved that, I thank you, everybody. Why don't you send send information to me? Um, I would probably want to check in with you, Candace, and and, and Michael, and maybe um, uh, maybe Jim. I want to check back in with you and Joyce as well. Um, and do send me information as soon as you can. If you could do it right after this meeting, that would be great. While well, it's fresh. I would appreciate it. Kate, can you reiterate what type of information you want from us? I'm looking for um, one, your thought on the select group. Two, your thoughts on the timeline. And three, your thoughts on uh, the, the work with the study. about the study, what the study should include? Yes. Response to its, there, I think that there were four focus points, for example. Look at the areas of focus. Um, look at the purpose. But I think the main thing is the areas of focus and the role of responsibility. Okay, I again want to thank uh, so much Candace and, Mi Candace and Michael for joining us today and helping us with this, um, given an, an incredibly unreasonable time frame. but that happens. Sometimes it's our best work, who knows? <laughs> Not to worry. Yeah, so I will be in touch. Okay, thank you. And with that, I will let you know if I need to pull the committee together again um, before our, our floor on Friday. Currently, we have our meeting after floor um, from two to four. And um, we'll see where we are, if, if this is gonna be, if this will have already sailed or whether we have time. So, I thank you all. I will see you tomorrow on the floor, so to speak. And I look forward to hearing from you. And with that, we can go offline.